Something's fishy. How fishy is it, Pam? It's fishy. We are making a traditional British fish and chips. And I'm going to make an untraditional bouillabaisse. And I'm doing a spin on coleslaw that's going to use purple cabbage, almonds, and golden raisins. So Pam, let's get cooking. So what are we going to do? So Lee, we're going to start with the purple cabbage mm -hmm. coleslaw. Um, I'm going to prep the cabbage. What I'm going to do is just slice it in half. This is a little one. Don't you think this is a little one? Oh yeah. Oh, small. This is very untraditional because I'm used to having coleslaw, obviously, with a green cabbage. This, yeah, and, and this will be really pretty. And, and sweeter? The same. I think it will be sweeter, yes. So I'm going to cut it in half and then I'm going to cut it into quarters because I'm going to run this. You can slice this with, by hand with a knife, very thin. Lee, maybe while I'm processing one part, she can show you. She'll slice hers by hand, but I'm gonna just run it. Now you wanna take this core out. I was just gonna ask you if it had a core just like the yep. green cabbage. Yeah, so I'm just gonna put it on an angle, and then because it's in quarters, you wanna get that cut into it on the side and get most of that core out because that doesn't taste good. Although, ah, there are some people who eat that. I was going to say, I think I know someone who eats that. So maybe we're going to put a piece over here for the person who does eat the core of the cabbage. Um, and then the rest oh, of it. Oh, we got some here too. Yeah. So. The rest of it, I have to make this smaller to fit into my food processor. Yeah, so I take all that back. There's another nice piece. That one doesn't have any, and that looks pretty mm -hmm. good. Yep. So, um, I'll tell you what, if you want to slice some by sure. hand, I'm going to run the rest of this through my food process, and we'll see what the difference this is. Kind of, this, this is the way my mother used to do it, because they didn't have food processors, so she used to just cut it very thinly. Okay, this is going to get loud. I think I'm going to beat you. I think you are too, because <laughs> now I'm having a mechanical problem. Yeah, you will beat me. Okay, so here we go. Although I think, how's that? That's beautiful. Now, we're gonna use all of this for one serving or? Well, what we're gonna do is, um, I'm gonna mix this with the carrots. I have four carrots that I've already shredded, grated like this. And I'm gonna divide the mixture in half and put half in a zippy bag and put it in the freezer to use uh -huh. another time. So you already have your coleslaw mix already made and then the rest we'll prepare for right now. So I am gonna, we are gonna use all the cabbage. So let's see how this came out. This will be, okay. All right, let's look at yours, oh, hold up yours. So you have longer, cause I, have I longer. had to cut mine to get it into the, I. I think it'll be fun. So it's shorter is, now. Yeah. So that's going in. I have a couple more, two more pieces to process here. And so I think this is all your preference. If you want them, um, you could even use the blade to do this one, which was the shredding blade. But I wanted the cabbage to be a little different than the um, carrots. That's just my preference. Yep. But everyone can do it the way they, but they prefer. This is going to be very colorful because of the red cabbage, I think. It is. And um, this, we're not using mayonnaise. It's going to be a vinegar and canola based dressing. So you can take it on a picnic and not worry about right. anything getting warm or spoiled. Absolutely, because yep, there's no mayonnaise in this, which I kind of like that. And it will complement the fish really well. All right, this is the last bit. Okay, you can see this is gonna be huge. That's a so, lot of cabbage from that one little head. Yeah, it kind of seems like it grows when you start cutting it up. So there is a few cabbage. big chunks in here, which I'm going to. Oh good, thank you. Out. While you go ahead and here comes the carrots. 
So then I think the easiest thing to do is just to, I'm going to just mix it with my clean hands. Mm -hmm. So look at that already, huh? Very pretty. Yeah, this is, this is a good recipe. Lee found this recipe and she sent it over to me and I just thought, yeah, that's, that's the one we want to use. Of course, everyone has a favorite coleslaw recipe, I bet, but it's fun to change it up. Yes, it is. It gets a little boring. Okay, so <clears throat> this I'm just going to put to the side and we are going to start building. We're going to clean up a little bit here. Make and then I'm going to start the dressing. And there is an unusual thing in the dressing. So the dressing calls for one tablespoon of balsamic vinegar. That's going to go in. It calls for two tablespoons of seasoned rice vinegar, which you find it in the oriental section mm -hmm. or yep. with the vinegars. Either way, it depends on where you shop. So that it's goes it's in. It's a fairly inexpensive ingredient. Yes. And I'm going to have a quarter of a teaspoon of salt and then I have water, one tablespoon of water. That goes in, and then this, I might need that little spatula. This oh, is yeah. one teaspoon of maple syrup. Hmm. Yeah. Very unusual. It is. So one teaspoon of maple, not a lot. Make the sweet cabbage even sweeter. Yeah, because that's, that's not a huge amount, but it's probably, it's just enough. So that goes in. So, could you pass me that whisk? Yes. I'm going to whisk this, and then we're going to whisk in canola oil. Two tablespoons of canola oil. So you can see why this is not very Whoa, much. Is that fragrant. I'm getting all the vinegar. I am too. It's sweet. This is not a lot of dressing, so that's why we're going to divide this cabbage. And then I'm going to put in the canola oil and whisk that to emulsify it. And as simple as that, that's our dressing. So I do have a zippy bag handy. So I'm going to take out half. That was fairly easy. Went together that very quickly. Very quick. Actually, so did this. So, yep. Look at that. Wow. It almost looks like party confetti. It does. And it feels like it too, to tell you the truth. It's all. Has so a great now you've texture. got coleslaw today and coleslaw next week. Right. You know what I'm thinking though? You not only to make this into coleslaw again, but you could add this into some types of soups, mm -hmm. couldn't you? And have that all made up. So yeah. So I'm gonna zip this. I'm gonna pop it in my freezer. And you saw the dressing, and, and if you're not in the mood for this dressing, you could just use a mayonnaise-based dressing. Yeah. So this is for another day. Perfect. And then Lee, you could probably just... What about our other ingredients? You've got oh, some I'm, other stuff. Is that I going am. in later? I'm going to put that in at the end. So okay. I think if you could put the dressing over. And then we'll mix that around. Perfect. And give it a little... There you go. Thank you. So we'll mix this really good. Yeah, because this amount of dressing certainly wouldn't all of that that we prepared. So to finish off the salad, I'm going to use some almonds. I'm going to use almonds two different ways. I'm going to use a slivered almond, which is, you know, the little slivered guys. I'm going to use some of those. And this is to your taste. I'm just eyeballing this. Mm -hmm. So I might add more. I might not. Put those in a zippy bag and get those for next week. That's right. That's right. And then these are the, um, the almonds. Well, actually, these are sliced. These are slivered. Oh. See, these are slivered. It does look like a sliver. These are sliced. So I'm using the two different kinds. But you I don't think. have to. You, can you use, don't have you can to. use one kind. I just kind of thought it'd be fun for texture. Mm -hmm. And then I'm using golden raisins, but you could use currants. You could use dried cranberries, some type of dried food that Ooh, you like. Dried cranberries might be interesting. Yeah. Or black, you know, your regular mm -hmm. raisins. But I thought these yeah, golden This is adding ones. another color. Yeah, that's why I kind of. So I'm going to mix it up and just see. You can tell me what you think. I'm just going to mix it and see where we stand. You know, the nuts versus the raisins versus the slaw. Hmm. I don't know. I'm Smells delicious. I'm thinking some more almonds. Sure. Why not? Well, I mean, yeah, you like the crunchy 
and a couple more raisins, and I'm going to call that, so I'm going to put wrap over it, and this is going to wait for us while we finish mm -hmm. the bouillabaisse and the fish and chips. So we have this part that goes with the fish and chips all done. And that is our purple coleslaw with almonds and golden raisins. Great. All right, into the fridge. going to make our anytime bouillabaisse. What does that mean? Well, I call it my anytime bouillabaisse because usually when you make bouillabaisse, it's made with fresh fish. That means when you get up in the morning, you have to decide this is what you're going to make, get in the car, drive to wherever you buy your fresh fish, buy it, bring it home, and make your bouillabaisse. My anytime bouillabaisse uses all frozen fish. So it's just a little take, something a little bit easier. Not that you couldn't make this with fresh fish, but right. again, it's just the ease. So we're going to start off with a large stock pot, and I've got a quarter of a cup of olive oil. Now, a bouillabaisse, the three elements that must be in a good bouillabaisse is good olive oil, meaning in this case, we're cooking with extra virgin olive oil. Okay. Normally, you just use regular olive oil, and extra virgin is res reserved for salads, but in this case, we want the extra virgin. It must have good saffron, okay. and it must have fish. Okay. Now, saffron. There's no substitute for it, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but anyways, we're going to get this started. So a quarter of a cup of olive oil on the pan. Thank you. And here I have one large leek that I have uh, cleaned and chopped into small pieces. Now, did you use the white part only or some of the white part? Some, of, some the of the green, green. but okay. only the part that was tender. The very tops of it is very hard, okay. and I cut those off and threw them away. They just... They're not very good. Right. So you said that was one leek, right? One leek. Okay. And this is one large onion, again, finely chopped. And what we're going to do here is we're going to get these on the stove on a medium heat. Okay. And just get them until they are translucent, soft. Okay. About how many? Three About minutes? five minutes. Five minutes. Three, three to five minutes, okay. depending on how warm your stove is. So, could you do sure would. get that on the stove for me while I show how to make a bouquet garni? Absolutely. And a bouquet garni is a mixture of certain veg uh, vegetables, uh, certain yeah vegetables and spices that it are going to season this bouillabaisse. base. And in this case, we are using two bay leaves, some of the tops of celery because that's where a lot of your flavor is in mm -hmm. these leaves. Okay. Some thyme, fresh thyme and some fresh parsley. And what I have here is a plant of parsley. You can buy these in your supermarket. And the good thing about these is I can use the tops and then go outside and plant them and have more later on. That's awesome. So, I'm so you buy it once and you'll have it all summer. Right. And I don't need this much. I'll save this for the sauce that we're going to be making in a little while. So we're going to make a bouquet garni. And this is a piece of cheesecloth. If you don't have cheesecloth, you can't find it or you don't want to spend the money on it, you can use probably a coffee filter. Oh, that's a good idea. Filter. So we're going to put our parsley in there, our two bay leaves, our celery tops, and our thyme. And the reason we're doing this is later on you want to be able to fish these out of the soup without the hard bay leaves and all oh, those. Oh, yeah. Um, and I've done that too. You're chasing it around in the soup pot, and you know, absolutely. or you forget it and somebody gets it in their soup, and that's, that's nasty. unpleasant. Yes. Yeah. Not, not very good. I've done that. So do this. And another thing you can do is leave the string long and tie it to the handle of the pot. That's a good idea. It, this one won't get lost, but sometimes when you do it, it's in a deep soup. So right. That's a perfect we're idea. We're going to put this aside. And now we're going to have to just wait until our vegetables get translucent, and then we'll add the rest of the ingredients and get going. So Excellent. Be right back. All right, before we proceed with the rest of the bouillabaisse, let's talk a little bit about saffron. Now, I know a lot of people know it's the most expensive spice on earth. And depending upon the grade, saffron can run anywhere from $1,500 to over $5,000 a pound. A pound? A pound. This little jar, which only has that much in it, was almost $6, and I considered that a bargain. Mm -hmm. I went to several supermarkets in my area, and I found about the equivalent of this, and they wanted $20 for the bottle. But I kept searching oh around in some specialty food stores, and I found this, which is Spanish saffron, which is one of the better ones. 
and it was a little over five dollars. So, and we don't even need this much. We need maybe. So does a little bit go a long way with yeah, the Yeah, a little bit goes, it okay. has a very distinct flavor and it adds color, that orangey color oh, okay. to um, whatever you put it in. Now one thing you don't want to do is try to find a substitute. You cannot use turmeric, which some people say. It will change the taste completely and it's more yellow. It's just, okay. it's really not so good. So you, you really have to can't use. skimp on this. You've got to find it and... If you're going to make bouillabaisse, you must have saffron. Okay. That's just the way it is. So there's a generous pinch. So can you bring me over the pot? Sure. The uh, vegetables, the leeks, and the onions have gotten slightly translucent. So now we're going to add that saffron. We're going to add, I took two large tomatoes and I peeled them. I put them in boiling water mm -hmm. and peeled them and chopped them. I didn't bother taking out the seeds or the juice. We're putting that all into the recipe. So that's two large tomatoes. Okay. Then we have like three cloves of chopped garlic. An unusual addition, you might say, is a piece of orange, but this is traditional flavor in Marseille. Orange peel. So just really? one little piece of orange peel. I never would have thought that, yeah. but go, go figure. Then we have <clears throat> a large roasted red pepper. You can do it yourself, roast it yourself, or you can do what I did and buy it in a jar. Okay. Just chop it up. So either way is So it's about fine. three quarters of a cup. Okay. And then I had one large Yukon Gold potato. It doesn't have to be Yukon Gold, but that's what I had in my kitchen. Chopped up. And that goes in. This will add a little bit of thickening as well as flavor. Now it looks like that's not chopped fine, but they're not big like chowder chunks either right. somewhere. Right, no. They're smaller than chowder chunks. <coughs> chowder <me>. chunks. <laughs> okay. Can you add some salt and pepper on this, please? I would to. So healthy pinch. Good, healthy pinch, yep. More? A little bit more. Okay. And a little pepper. And now our bouquet garni that we made. Okay. Now we need some fish. All right, let me get the fish. I believe it's still in the fridge. It is. So what we're going to use today is, I told you I'm using frozen fish because this is my anytime bouillabaisse. And I brought some frozen pollock. And there's also some shrimp in there. Can you get that oh, out, please? Yes. So we're taking our frozen pollock, laying it on top of those vegetables. And then I have a pound of shrimp with the shells on. With the shells on. The shells are going to add flavor. OK. OK, so there goes that. And later on, we're going to add some mussels. But right now, we'll put those in later. And now on top of this, can you get me that can? We've got about four cups of, <coughs> excuse me, clam broth. You can put that in. Sure. Now, I'm going to put the whole can. Yes, the whole can. Okay. You want to cover the fish. And the fish is going in You frozen. could use water if you don't have the broth. Now, we you did we just de-thawed this fish a little bit, A right? little bit. OK. All right, so one okay. whole can. That's about it. We covered it up. So now back on the stove for about 15 minutes. Okay. Now we're going to make the sauce for the bouillabaisse. It's called the sauce rui, which is served on the side. You put a little dollop on later on. What we need is, like, I took some very crusty bread, cut the crusts off, and we need to pulse that, which is going to come out to about a quarter cup. Okay. With enough parsley to make a quarter cup. So let's pulse those two together. All right, just <laughs> tell me when. Just make crumbs out of it. Now to that, we're going to add two cloves of garlic, pinch of cayenne. Yum. OK. A little pepper, a little salt. Okay, one tablespoon of lemon juice and about a quarter cup of red peppers, roasted red peppers. Okay, you want to give it a whirl? I will. Okay, with the motor running, got okay. about a third of a cup of the olive oil. I 
have to spatula it down yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I think bit. so. Yeah. This looks good. What else can you put this on top of? Or is it just traditional for the soup? I guess you can put it on top of anything you want. All right, here we It's go. traditional for the soup, but okay. it has... Add a little bit more olive oil. Okay. I'm going to give it a scrape down again. Yeah. We want a paste, we don't want a liquid. Okay. That's getting there. Well, it's pasty on the bottom, but yeah. I think. The sides need a little help. Yeah, well, I only have one blade for this because the other blade broke, so I'm probably... Let's see. Yeah, we'll work what with it. Think? We'll work It's all those margaritas you made. I know it. You broke the blenders. <laughs> Tired. So we'll put that aside and we'll just wait until our Rui, uh, our bouillon base is all done and then we okay. can add it. So we'll be back in a little while. All right, Pam, show me your stuff. Yeah, it's time for the chip part of the fish and chips, which is French fries, but they call them chips in Britain. So what we're going to do is we're using a russet potato, just a regular russet potato. Um, yeah, I pick out even size ones out of the bag. Some of them were a little smaller. And we want to square them off, make them into a big rectangle, and then we'll start cutting the fries. So the best thing to do is take one end off and another. And you can save these pieces for if you're making soup or whatever. You don't have to toss them out. And then you slice one side and then roll it onto the side you just cut. And then take a sliver off another side. You're just trying to make the potato even. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really not much more to it than that. Take the other side off and then roll it onto the side you just cut. And, and you're leaving some of the skin off. I am. You could have peeled them, mm -hmm. which is perfectly fine. I was just being a little lazy, so I decided not to. So now you, you have a nice little package rectangle. So you just want to make even fries. I did some before. So you want your fries to be uniform so they cook at the same time and it's just more pleasing if they're all the same. So this is what we're shooting for. So I'm going to cut the potato in half and then looking at the slices I already did, you just eyeball it so they're all about the same. And these have little pieces of skin on them. I'm not going to worry about that for this outing. Um, I think it really just comes down to well, how there's much a lot time of nutrients in the uh, skin. That's anyway. true. So well, this guy's a little chubby. We'll just cut him off like that, and that's it. So the next part is they're all in a bowl. I have all the potatoes in a bowl, and I am going to put about two tablespoons of canola oil on them. And what makes this recipe special? The reason why I wanted to do this recipe is when you're making fish and chips at home, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. The fish is ready and the chips aren't, right. or the chips are ready and the fish aren't, and neither one of them really can wait for it's the other. It's one of the hardest parts of cooking is timing. Right, so this is the deal with this. I'm going to toss these with the canola oil, then we're going to put them in a microwave, you know, microwave proof bowl or dish. Um, I'm going to probably have to do this. No salt on these at this Not point. yet, no. Okay. So they're going to go in and you're going to cover them with plastic wrap oh. and you're going to microwave them on high for about eight minutes, six to eight minutes until they just get a little translucent, a little tender. And then we're going to, um, I'm going to, what am I trying to say? I'm going to stir them halfway through. So oh, okay. I'm going to put them in for four minutes. Mm -hmm. Turn them around and then You're giving them, them a head start. Put them in another four minutes, right? And then just to tell you what how the rest of the recipe is going to go, once they come out of the microwave, after the eight minutes total, I'm going to rinse them in cold water, and rinse all the oil off in cold water. Then I'm going to pat them dry, put them on a clean tea towel, 
and pat them so they're very, very dry. Then they'll be fried one time for just a short period of time. Take them out. At what temperature? Let them about 350 okay. degrees in oil. And then they're going to fry a second time. And it's this whole step, it sounds like a lot, but it's really not that complicated. It will make sure that when my fish is ready, when the fish is coming out and I'm salting it and getting it ready, these will go in for the last second fry time. and right. they'll be done. So that being said, I'm just going to cover them up, pop them in the microwave for the first step. None of these steps are labor intensive. Just you, you got to do them and then the, they come out better too when they're mm -hmm. fried twice. So great. In they go. And now what we could do, Lee, is we can I can start getting the batter ready for the fish and chips. Great, let's so, go. All right, all next right, step. Lee, what? We're, this is the batter part. We're getting close. Cool. So the batter is one and a half cups of all-purpose flour, a half a cup of cornstarch. Makes it more tender. Yep. Oh, I, this is really good. A half a teaspoon each of paprika and cayenne pepper, which... Little I, kick. I put a little more cayenne in there because I really like that on the That's fish. Okay. And then salt and pepper, and I'm going to whisk this. So was that like a teaspoon of salt and pepper, or just? Yeah, it was about a teaspoon. I don't tr truly, truthfully, I eyeballed it. It's, there it is, salt and pepper. Um, so we whisk that. I'm going to take three quarters of a cup of this mixture and put it on this rimmed baking sheet. Because with the fish, we're going to do it's going to be a dry, wet, dry, and then into the into the into the fryer. So this is going to be our dry right there. And then I have, I want to make sure I tell you right, one teaspoon of baking powder. And that's going to go in here. A little puffiness. A little puffiness. And for the most important ingredient, give that a mix. To make the wet wet, we're going to use one can of beer. You can use any kind of beer you like. I usually just use whatever's kicking around. This is to around. make the fish happy? This is to make the fish and the cook happy. Uh -huh. So I'm going to put some of, most of this in until it's a good consistency. Does it matter which brand? No, whatever you like. Uh, you know, I've used some pretty heavy duty beers, not a, a stout, but I've used some lagers. Is this what you want me to do? Yeah. And see how the baking soda is puffing up? Oh yeah, because well, the yeast from the from the beer too. Right, it's reacting with it. And I hear our French fries; they're still in step one in the microwave. They're going to be finishing up soon. I'm going to add a little more. I was going to say it looks a little thick to me. Yep, you want it to be. You don't want it to be a thick batter. You want it to be a little. Right. Well, we'll show you what it looks it's like. It's going to be almost like a tempura batter. Yes. Yeah cornstarch and everything in it, which is nice and light. It's not heavy. Right. And I think a little bit more, and I think... Oh, it's not going to leave much for you. Oh, I'm going to leave enough for me. <laughs> Never shortchange myself. So this is it. This is the two-step system. So the fish will go dry, wet, dry, fry. Look how that? Dry, wet, dry, fry. Ah, oh, you were a poet. <laughs> I know it. So we're at this point. I'm going to tend to... The microwave stop. I'm going to tend to the fries, and then it's... You know, fish and chips is one of those things that just all comes together, you know, very in the end. yeasty smelling. It is. Put that there. I'm going to get the fries and do a little cleanup. Okay. Okay, we're almost there. What's the, our next step? Well, I'm going to show you the fries. The fries were in the microwave for eight minutes, and I have just rinsed them You're under right. cold water. They're like almost translucent. Right. And. You're going to separate them, and the point is you want them dry before they go into the oil. Because water and oil, as you know, hot oh. water, I mean, water and hot oil is not a good thing. And you can see how starchy these are. Very. Some of them are kind of breaking apart, but you know what? I don't really care about that at all. So these just need to dry. Um, and we can pat them. And we will yeah, just move them. They just I'm go down the line. Here. Okay, now up front comes the fish. I got beautiful pieces of cod. You can use haddock. 
Um, you, you can actually use whatever fish you like, mm -hmm. right? So. Well, traditional New England would be haddock or cod. Right. So these are kind of big. I mean, somebody would love that, but I'm going to make these into yeah, little I know smaller. Somebody that would love it. Yeah. Little smaller portions. So, as I said, they're going to go dry first. And when I do them in the dry, I like to just let them rest for a minute. I don't, I think I read that somewhere. You just sort of, it lets the flour adhere. So we okay, have. I'll do that while you do that. Yep. Really nice fish. Okay, so they're in the dry. And I'm going to check on the oil. You know, I have a little secret. I don't, I bet, I'm sure you've heard of it, but to check the oil, some people put bread, some people do whatever. I'm going to mm -hmm. stick the measuring spoon in my pot. And if it bubbles around the measuring spoon, the oil's ready. Did I? Is yeah, that's correct. Good? I've heard that too. So I know I'm way back. Um, I actually might have to have Lee come look. What do you think, Lee? No, no. Lee needs a little bit more. So a little bit more time. That's OK. Give us time to wash our hands. That's right. So we'll wash our hands now. You don't want to get into this. The, dry, the wet part until you're really honestly ready to put the fish in the hot oil. Cause, so it's, this is a good place to stop because it's happy right there. And then we'll come back when the oil's ready. And then it's a boom, boom, boom. So okay. we'll get Okay, the french fries, we washed them. We patted them dry. They're nice and dry. The oil is ready. It's um, actually the oil's at 375. Um, so I'm gonna carefully take them over and please don't splash them into the oil. Hot oil will burn you bad. So I'm going to be as careful as I can be as well. Now remember, this is the first time they fry. They're going to fry one more time at the end when our fish is ready. So I'm just using this little strainer not only to get them in the oil, but I'll use them to get them out of the oil as well. I'm going to get a landing area for these french fries. You can use newspaper, paper towel. I'm going to use brown paper bags to do the fish, but since I already have these tea towels dirtied, I'm going to use them as a little draining pad. This will be my next batch going in. You don't want to overcrowd it because it brings down the temperature of the oil and you know they need room to kind of swim around in there so I'm have my first batch in. They're going to be in for about four, six minutes, I believe, six minutes, and then they'll come out and then they'll go in at the end until they're nice and crispy. And I just, I eyeball it. When they look golden brown like a french fry should, that's when I take them out, probably about five minutes. I'm using canola oil, by the way. Um, it's probably the best oil to do this type of frying. So. When you take these out, spread them out, you can see that they're having a little bit of color, but I'm going to spread them out. And just be careful with the oil. This really is a wonderful dish. So I'm going to get these last few, make sure I got everybody out of there. Yep. Um, and pretty much one container of oil is all you need. And what I do when I'm making fish and chips is I'll put the oil back in a bottle and I label it fish oil so I know that I've used that oil for fish and chips. And you can get a couple, a couple go-arounds. You know, don't toss the oil out. I wouldn't use it for anything else because once it has that fish in it, it's fishy. But, um, you know, you can get, and then strain it before you put it back in the bottle. Strain any little pieces of the potato that might be in there or pieces of the batter that came off the fish. But I use it well, three or four times and then I toss it out. So you want to get, because canola oil is not cheap. Not like saffron, it's not super expensive, but you know, you can use it more than once. Okay, this is the last on these.
Once the fries are in the oil, keep moving them around. Otherwise, they'll want to raft together, which means they want to stick together. And then you just get a potato clump, and that's no good. So you just give them a little. So when I get those other ones out, um, Lee, it'll be time to do the fish. This is it. Now we're here. We're in the 11th hour. It's the fish, I know. So we're getting into the yummy area. This is yummy, so you want to dip it in the wet. Well, I could have used tongs, but well. And then shake off the extra. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, tongs, you know, that's a good option. A little bit of the flour, again, not too much. And I'm calling that good, and it goes in to the hot canola oil. So like that, you can even go like that little back and forth. Now how many years have you been making this recipe? I've been doing this one for quite a while, probably about six years anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I found it. I, I, in, the instructions are easy to follow and once I did it was like, you'll never want to buy fish and chips out again on a Friday night. You just won't do it because you can do it for half the price at home. It's well, you delicious. You might do it just because if you get lazy and you don't feel like you cleaning might. up. But you <laughs> might. It won't be as good as this. It won't be as good as this. Is, this is really good. So and how long in the oil? Um, probably about eight minutes, eight to twelve minutes. Okay. Um, and then we have plastic and plastic paper bags. I here. do. I have paper bags here, which I just have to use the paper bags because that's what makes me happy. And the fish, the French fries went on the tea towels because I already dirty those. The fish are going to drain on the paper bags. I'm going to hit them with a nice amount of salt while they're hot coming out of the oil. So then the salt kind of adheres to them. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to wait. And then they're going to wait for their friends, the French fries. And then it's fish and chips. And the chips go in for how much more time after? About four minutes, not long. Um, just until they get golden brown. It's going to go really fast. The second one is going to go fast. So I'm not going to batter these. I don't want to overcrowd the pan. We just wait for that. So I'm just going to wait, wait for this first batch. That salt. Yep, you gotta have the salt. Gotta have the salt. To do, and this is the last one. We'll go. This is it. I suppose. You know, you're really not gonna fit. These are good sized pieces, don't you think, of fish? Mm -hmm. Um. Well, you got you know the fish obviously trails off, and the tail is a lot thinner, but right. And that's a nice fat piece of fish. This is a nice one. Um, I was thinking, would you get more if you had one of those fry daddy things than this pot? But I think it's about the same. No, I don't. No, I don't think you'd fit any more. The only thing about those is that they have a regulated thermometer, mm -hmm. so your heat is not going to go up and down as much. Right. And if it does, it'll bring it back up to ten. Yeah, I just kind of. I hate to say it. I let the Dutch well, oven do its own thing. Cast iron pans are wonderful. Just. And that, oh, by the way, that's what I am using is a, I should have mentioned that, cast iron pan. You want to use a heavy pan heavy. for this, not, because it's got to stand up to that oil and that heat. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye-bye. Last one. Okay, so we can clean We're up. We're start cleaning and up. And then we'll get ready. Yeah, ready oh, to. Oh, we still have to do the french fries one more time. One more time with the fries. Yep. Okay. Well, here is our fabulous fish spread. Oh, and I meant to tell you all that about five or six minutes before the um, bouillon base was done, I added two pounds of mussels and then closed the lid and let them open up. So we have that also in there. It looks great, and the bouillon base has the what was I that put on the, the top sauce again? rui, which is over here, the breadcrumbs and the parsley mm -hmm. and the garlic and all that stuff on top with some nice garlic bread, and then we have our fish and, and chips. chips here, which I just adore in the little basket, and in England they do serve it with, right in the newspaper, mm -hmm. but we just lined ours with a little paper towel in case that idea didn't work for you. And then we have our coleslaw, 
And then to go along, um, malt vinegar with the fish and chips. Very English. Haven't tried it, just try it. Mm -hmm. And then I made a quick tartar sauce, simple as just mayonnaise with some sweet pickle relish mixed together. That's it. So, cheers. cheers. Hope you enjoy it. Enjoy it.